The Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. You are at the Durian Heat with Grace. And this is Arlene. So good morning to you. So uh, with uh, in the conjunction of the CLEF, which will be kicking very, very soon. Oh, uh, yeah. O- yeah, October 16 to 18 at Publica. The Kuala Lumpur Eco Film Festival. I'm looking forward to it. Exactly. And this year, it hits the eighth year. And it's amazing how this festival has come uh, up till today. And they are getting bigger and bigger and of course having a lot more activities right and also musical performance that's yes. the part that I think a lot of young people will be looking forward yeah so this morning we both uh, me and Aline we are very excited mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, to be able to speak to this beautiful people here in our studio <laughs> and one his name is Jess Ibrahim he's a singer songwriter uh, he's also uh, very um, active when it comes to environmental issues and on the other hand we also have Elena Murang she's a very beautiful lady and yeah. she's very talented and she's an artist in Malaysia so let's say good morning to them hello good morning Hi. hello morning <laughs> how are you guys I'm good. How are you? Thank you. Yeah, we are okay. <laughs> right. So um, let's start our interview. But um, shall we start with Jess first? Uh, um, we have invited you before, but can you just uh, briefly introduce yourself again to our listeners? Right. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jess Ibrahim. Hi, I'm, Jess. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a musician, singer, songwriter, and um, like mentioned earlier, I've been involved uh, mm-hmm. with a few environmental uh, initiatives mm-hmm. in, in Malaysia and uh, yeah uh, for this year for the Eco Film Festival I'll be performing with my band mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for the Green Vibes and also for the Anugrah Hijau award ceremony that will, hap- that will happen on Saturday and Green Vibes on Sunday mm-hmm. so yeah uh, we're called Monsoon Market and for anyone out there who'd like to watch us perform <laughs> the Festival. Of course, yeah, monsoon please. market. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's go a bit further, Jess. Um, um, I know you've been always involved in all these environment issues, right? right? But how did you know about this festival, and how did you get involved and commit to this festival? Right. Um. Well, since 2006, um, I've along with uh, me and along with uh, an old schoolmate of mine, oh, yeah? uh, we started a non-governmental organization called Tree Theatre Group Mm -hmm. and our NGO uh, is a child and youth based NGO that uses performance uh, performing arts as a way to spread environmental messages right so we do um, songs and dance uh, on on environmental topics like biodiversity and uh, other social issues as well so since 2011 we've been invited uh, by the Ecofield Festival to participate and to do our performances uh, during their events and um, so I've I've I got to know of Eco Nights Mm -hmm. and Eco Film Festival through um, since then oh right okay so this is well it's been about four years. Four years yeah. since wow. you got to know them. Yeah. Wow. And that is a very strong relationship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so only recently I started doing my own um, music um, pro- project. Mm-hmm. And um, when I started the band, they invited us as well to come into our performances. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I've been involved ever since mm. 2011 with my NGO. Mm. And, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, really honored that they kept on uh, in- inviting. And of course, they have to yeah. invite you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's, it's really great, though, because uh, I think Ecofield Festival is one of those events which I, I'm not saying is is something lacking here in Malaysia, but mm-hmm. it's something very unique For in the sure. sense where they not only showcase uh, lo- local mm-hmm. um, films on environmental topics but also films from abroad yeah. the, the, the submissions are very diverse and it highlights very important environmental topics which I think if they did not screen here to the public a lot of people would not know of these, exactly. these yeah. things yeah. We, need, we need more of those um, awareness mm-hmm. about our environment right 
I totally with, uh, agree with Aline and Jess here uh, uh, about the awareness, especially when mm -hmm. it comes to environmental issue. Only recently we got to know all this haze and also uh, recycling and uh, dividing all these trashes. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, but then mm -hmm. it needs more awareness and uh, practices in Malaysia to, for all the younger generation especially to yeah. practice all and the activities. I think through film, like that's a really... Uh, powerful. Engaging, yeah, in very uh, powerful kind of uh, method of bringing that message across mm -hmm. because um, we're we're living in an age where you know visual is very uh, important. Important. And yeah, <laughs> it's very engaging and yep. pe people are more aware. I guess we will be more aware when uh, these things. Uh, yeah. Wait. For sure, yeah, and that's really wonderful. And then the journey you have taken so far, I think it's really amazing. And that's then, am yeah, not that's amazing. Mm -hmm, not only you, you are doing music, but you are also very uh, heavily involved in the, all those environmental activities. And that's another wonderful part that I can, you know, um, tell my uh, friends very proudly say, "Hey, I have a friend, and he's <laughs> a Malaysian, and he's really, really good at the things." <laughs> right? How about Elena? Could you introduce yourself and what? you do and then how did you get involved in the club this year sure so i'm um i'm a visual artist and also a musician mm -hmm. but mostly focused on art that is inspired by borneo so i grew up in sarawak in borneo mm -hmm. and it's a very very kind of you know green environment um used to go to the sea every weekend or to a waterfall or go hiking or something wow and then so obviously like now a lot of that kind of impacts my work so a lot of my visual language or the music that i play mm -hmm. um so how i got involved in kleff was um so i just moved back to kl probably December mm -hmm. um, and so it's still like quite new in KL I'd never been to KL EFF before and I got a call from Yasmin saying that um, you know she wanted to meet up for coffee so mm -hmm. I was like okay <laughs> <laughs> so I went along and I met up with her and she said um, she kind of explained to me what KL EFF was and how it had progressed over the years and she said and um, you know we'd really like it to invite you to be our ambassador for this. And I said, yeah, of course. Wow. And, she, and she goes, oh, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> she thought she, she would have to like, I don't know, maybe coerce me a bit more. But no, I think it's a really, really great initiative because mm -hmm. not only for like the films that they have, but you know, they, they have like the artwork and the stalls and the talks and the workshops and the music as well. It's like a whole community market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just meant for you know awareness on sustainability as well as the environment. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things look yeah. forward to. So, uh, for those listening, please do come. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> but yeah. Elena, mm -hmm. um, could you tell why you are so passionate about the environment and how do you relate those environment to your paintings and in music? Yeah, I mean, the environment is the the natural environment. It's just so beautiful to be around and it's so I think it's something I mean it's natural right mm -hmm. so when I'm there and I think for a lot of people when you're in the natural environment there's some it, it just calms you down sometimes and um it's just a really really beautiful place and it, <laughs> it holds so much knowledge so even the people who live there in the villages and mm -hmm. trees and the birds and you know the stars there's so much you can tell from them mm -hmm. you know some things obviously like i don't know but i think there's so much more to learn right well yeah. if i'm not mistaken you've been to your uh, hometown several times to do some fundraising projects as well right yeah so uh, my village is called long mm -hmm. and it's right it's it's close to the sarawak kalimantan border mm -hmm. so it's part of miri um and earlier this year there was a flood there and it, it it never floods there, <laughs> not in my <laughs> lifetime anyway. So all of the four bridges were washed away by the flood. Mm -hmm. um, so I just did some fundraising by selling my artwork uh, to build to build a bridge back for them. So the bridge kind of connects the village to the f rest of their farms. So is it all completed yeah. or is it still ongoing? Yeah, it's completed. Oh, so, nice. so it was only enough funds for one of the four bridges. And the, mm -hmm. other, the other three bridges were supposed to be built by... Um, 
some private companies and stuff, but that hasn't been done yet. Mm. Well, that's fantastic. Mm. How about, uh, let's uh, go back to Jess here. <laughs> How about you, Jess? Uh, you've briefly mentioned about your theater project and also the music as well as the, your activities that are involved in the environmental issues. Could you elaborate more on that? And uh, how did you start and wha- what are the areas that concerns you the most? Um, well, ever since my primary school days, our school has, um, with um, I think the PIBG and the Teacher Association, they uh, organized a few recycling projects, mm. which coincided with the yearly animal conservation initiative. So what what happened was that for each year, the school would select an agent animal, mm. and we would raise funds through recycling um, newspaper collection as as a way to help uh, various NGOs involved in. Mm. Um, for example, in turtle conservation, in elephant conservation. So from there, um, I got my exposure, I guess, to these kind of issues, but it's more to wildlife uh, right. conservation. Mm-hmm. Um, however, when I was nine, um, I was invited by a friend to attend camp by Yayasan Anak Warisan Alam, mm-hmm. or Yawa, and they're a child-based uh, NGO. And from there, I learned more about uh, uh, further about environmental topics such as climate change, mm. recycling, um, and uh, 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 various issues. It was through Yes and Awar San Alam I was able to um, participate with them in various international conferences organized mm-hmm. by the United Nations Environment Program called the Tunza uh, Program, which is a program for children where they organize biannual conferences so every two years they'll oh, have an international conference and they'll gather NGOs from all over the world and then there I was I, I, I it kind of like expanded more like so mm-hmm. it kept on progressing on mm-hmm. my exposure to environmental topics and I and I found out that it just inspired me because I got to know that not only myself kids around here who does it you know, happen to do environmental activities, mm. but around the world, like kids are really trying hard to get their message across on various things. There's, uh, there's on desertification. Um, there's things on um, food waste and management. There's mm. things on uh, f- energy mm-hmm. consumption and and so eventually, when um, as I participated in the youth program. With uh, for Tunza and the United Nations Women Program, I um, also got involved, and eventually I was nominated to be a representative for Asia and Pacific mm-hmm. for their Youth Advisory Council. No, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and about last year, um, they uh, we had the first uh, United Nations Environmental Assembly. Mm-hmm. So um, usually how you know how the United Nations have the General Assembly, but it's the first time that environmental assembly where they had environmental ministers mm-hmm. from all over the world to come and discuss, and yeah, it, it was it was really refreshing, yeah. um, and it was uh, quite a challenge for us to get our uh, voices and our point mm-hmm. of views uh, to the table, which we eventually did. We got to draft like a resolution that we. Uh, got to submit. So you managed to touch on the various sections? Yes, mm-hmm. on we talked about climate change, we talked about indigenous people's rights, mm-hmm. um, animal mm-hmm. conservation and and those are and yeah. But um more recently I was uh, involved with a um an NGO, uh Perubahan Iklim um Bel- Persatuan Perubahan oh Iklim uh, Belia Malaysia. It's climate change youth association. Uh, yes, <laughs> association, uh, youth association, and they organize the their third power shift uh, conference or so power power shift uh, Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Um, power shift basically started in Istanbul in 2000 and 2012 like that around mm-hmm. times. I'm sorry, I if I mistaken the date, but. Um, basically, it's a platform for young people who wants to be uh, involved in campaigning or activism, environmental activism, speci- um, more specifically to climate change. Mm-hmm. But it's where they gather uh, different people who can provide skills on how to um, go about that campaign, uh, what they can do, um, the tools they can they can use. So recently, about last month, we they had the third power shift and yeah so the young people in Malaysia are quite active yes I mean to say Mm. that the level of awareness is maybe it's not as widespread but 
the young people that are you know conscious on environment environmental issues they seem to be very active right participating yeah. in either local or regional even international in, events in fact under the uh, same um, NGO persatuan uh, mm. perubahan iklim belia malaysia they uh, have selected 20 young malaysians who would represent uh, malaysia um, in the COP21 conference in Paris. So from oh. yeah. different states, is it? Yes, in from Malaysia. different states in Malaysia. Amazing. Mm. So, yeah, it, um, actually young people are quite active here in, in, in Malaysia. And the COP21 uh, conference is one of those um, turning points since Kyoto Protocol. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yes. Mm. hopefully something would be coming out of it. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Mm, how about you, Elena? What is your perspective when it comes to young Malaysians today? Do you think they are much aware of the environment issues nowadays or um, they would, we need a sort of a proper or better educational system in Malaysia? I think um, there's definitely there's, there are definitely a lot of young people who are active in kind of envir- environmentalism, mm-hmm. but I think there are a lot more that are not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's just kind of like in in the circle that I'm in, there are a lot of you know young people doing it. Um, but there's <laughs> basically I, there's a I, there's a greater need for more, you yeah. know. Elena, because, yeah. Elena, I, I'm I'm wondering why. Uh, the awareness among um, some sec- segments of youth are mm. not there when it comes to uh, environment. Is it uh, because the access of information is not there? or? Yeah, I think it's definitely like the knowledge as well mm-hmm. because, you know, some people just don't know that the, the impact that's, for example, taking your lunch away in styrofoam packets has mm-hmm. on the environment, you know, and mm-hmm. I think if you don't, Number one, they either don't know the impact. If you do know the impact, I think it's too far removed from you. So there's that behavior attitude gap. So it's even though you actually want to save the environment, it's too far away from you um, to actually take action to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I really think it's to do with education, educating, educating adults as well um, so of that course. they can support their children and, you know, and and build a way of life that's more environmentally friendly. And also maybe building new habits and new culture. I mean, in the past, exactly. using plastic bags was a norm, right, among right. Malaysians. But nowadays, it's, I think it's a new culture that yeah. we bring our own uh, paper bag or our own reusable exactly. bag. And yeah. some supermarkets have uh, their charging plastic yeah. bags. Yeah. On Saturday on especially. Saturdays, and yeah. it all started from Penang, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They oh, really? initiated mm-hmm. this project. And, and also the waste separation um, just recently, yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's something uh, it's very, it's kind of a milestone mm-hmm. as well. We also just started in Durian Arts actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. to be honest, a bit of hassle, mm-hmm. but then when you think that um, when you separate all these treasures, you feel it's more organized right. and then you know where all you are putting your treasures for. Mm-hmm. So, mm. okay, this one is for the recycling. This is not, you know, are recyclable so we just separate them so right. it's all sort of like educating us um, consciously and unconsciously yes. as well so mm. let's continue our conversation after this short break we'll come back the durian heat bringing big ideas and critical opinions in southeast asia Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And you're at the Durian Hit with Grace. And Arlie. So we've been speaking with Alena, who is an artist in Malaysia, as well as Jess Ibrahim, who's a singer-songwriter. So let's continue our conversation from the first segment. We've talked about the awareness and how we want to educate the younger generation, especially. So Jess Ibrahim, do you want to add more on that um, in terms of the political will uh, when it comes to environmental issues, right. any organization, how they've been acting? But perhaps uh, on the other side, you don't see much of the execution. Um, I think uh, it's definitely a, a, a big need for mm-hmm. things to happen from a grassroots level, mm-hmm. as opposed to just uh, implementations from the uh, governments and, right. and so on. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, we are so used to top down when it comes to yeah. implementation. We always think that okay, this is the government's responsibility. We should just demand for it. But I think it comes both ways. Mm-hmm. Yes, I yeah. think it needs to have that balance from mm-hmm. both sides. Uh, you definitely need the enforcement in one end, but you also need the culture from the other. And I think the people need to start changing their habits in terms of consumption. Um, 
especially consumption because right. I think right now in the in we're in an age where the, um, things get produced very easily but they also get wasted easily mm-hmm. as well so yeah mm-hmm. we and and you know just a bit of a fun fact Malaysia is actually one of the biggest coal consumer mm-hmm. right in Southeast Asia most, most probably yeah. and, and yeah. Th- this is is this is worrying because coal is one of those mm-hmm. I would say evil energy <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not clean yeah um, it's not clean at all there's a yeah there's a there's a need to educate the people as well on, on the type of things they they use because it's very impactful to the environment and Malaysia has on a list of a lot of things like we see <laughs> just where we're also I think the highest deforestation rate we have the highest deforestation rate right. in, in yeah. the world at the moment and it comes from you know a, a lot of things on the type of businesses and development for developments sure yeah. that uh, we involve ourselves in mm-hmm. so there's a shift that's needed and and I think we're at a point where it's not too late because we still have the resources, mm-hmm. uh, our natural resources, but we also have the potential of adopting alternative S- ways of consuming energy and stuff like that. There's an organization called uh, Aman, Anam Malaysia Anti Nuclear, right. and they're opting for green energy and also for solar. Uh, energy, for example, which I think is a big potential here in in Malaysia. And um, they are against yeah. nuclear energy. Uh, yes, yes, and also the reduction of fossil fuels is um, is I think much uh, it's much needed. Mm-hmm. And now there's a and but apart from that, I think w- uh, right now we're seeing a, a I wouldn't say a trend, but a movement that's happening across the board at different um, aspects of society. In terms of re- religiously, like um, in June, the encyclical of the Pope on clim- mm-hmm. the Pope had an encyclical on on climate change, for example, mm-hmm. uh, opting for uh, you know, uh, Catholic Christians to you know adopt more sustainable lifestyle and and also to combat climate change. And also in August, they had the Islamic declaration on climate change. Mm-hmm. And even years before that, I think the, the communities. Um, uh, the religious uh, religious communities from the Buddhist and Hindu side had earlier on already had um, made their own declaration on on these things. And wh- why I I highlight this top um, topic on religion in relation to environment because we're in Malaysia, especially we're in a society where we're multi-religious, multi multinational as well, but mm-hmm. also spirituality is kind of like uh, one of our uh, roots in culture and, mm-hmm. and and religion goes along true. with it. Mm-hmm. And in fact, this Sunday they're going to have a interfaith dialogue in this Ilham, coming Sunday. Yes, in Ilham mm-hmm. Ilham Gallery, um, where they're going to talk about religions and their relations to climate change and the environment. Wow, oh, that's which, amazing. Yeah, and I think um, I think that's one way to also try to uh, how we can help uh, change the culture. And the habit of society, because a lot of our majority, I think, of um, the people here are, I, w- I wouldn't put the term okay, <laughs> religious, because like you know, I can't say for sure, but they definitely are influenced by the uh, um, religious uh, values, values, and, and stuff. And, like and that. I think at the end of the day, like the more groups, uh, diverse groups, either from religious groups or even uh, ethnic communities, mm-hmm. right. uh, that can speak out on the issue of climate change that that goes across the board. You know? Exactly, and I think it will influence a lot of, of, of people. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Well, uh, well, that's very amazing. Uh, coming from a religious point of view, how they want to uh, relate uh, themselves to the environmental issue and to be educated their own community. Uh, um, I mean, it always needs to start uh, somewhere and then small, yeah. and then I'm sure it, as long as they start somewhere, it will go um, uh, to the extent where they they'll be able to reach bigger groups in the future. But Elena, in in your hometown, uh, how is it? Uh, like there, uh, when it comes to environment issues, are there any uh, activists or any uh, sort of uh, form of groups there who have been heavily involved in this so- sort of area? Sure. So last weekend, I was actually in Kuching for a gig. Actually, Jess was there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we were playing for um, the social enterprise called Barefoot Mercy. And Barefoot Mercy, they work to bring um, solar lights and microhydro to the rural areas. 
so it's you know a form of clean energy as well mm-hmm. um there's 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 quite a um, there is quite a movement in kuching now at least mm-hmm. and i think i think it's on honestly i think it's because people have kind of lived outside of kuching in malaysia and now they've come back to kuching and they've brought brought more sustainable practices i think so mm-hmm. greater awareness about like not using plastic bags about carpooling um but those like little things that mm-hmm. individuals can do even like switching off your aircon mm-hmm. not using a dryer mm-hmm. yeah interesting i i'm interested in the micro hydro sure. power because mm-hmm. i think uh in sabah and sarawak the geography is a bit different than in Semenanjung. Uh, mm. A lot of the villages are off the grid when right. it comes to power grids. Mm-hmm. So are there a huge movement there in Sabah Sarawak right now to encourage villages to use micro hydro power? Um, and I can't say much for Sabah because I'm not very sure. In Sarawak now, they've uh, the chief minister, I think a few weeks ago, just announced that Um, the Baram Dam will not be happening. Oh, so that's so cool! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was going to explain to you what the Baram Dam was. So <laughs> yeah, you know about it. And um, from what I hear, um, that he's going to try and start encouraging micro hydro more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that you know, it's and you talk about geography as well, and it's a lot of it's because. The, it, it's hard to travel into the interiors and when you actually want to like build something. So, for example, when we were rebuilding the bridge, quite a lot of the cost came from actually just transporting materials, you know, like 10 hours on a logging road, for example. Um, so things that are off-grid actually, you know, could work. Um, my village now, Long Puluan, is... If I'm not mistaken, it's 100% running on solar power. Wow. Yeah, since the start of this year. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. It is. Well, uh, we've talked about all those um, organi- organizations as well as the government will a- and including a religious community as well uh, when it comes to environment issues. But I find it to be very irony when it comes to uh, when we see all the scientific uh, innovations and the really advanced technology coming in. And at the same time, uh, As much as awareness awareness level is there in Malaysia, but still it needs to be pushed more. And it's right. very irony that it doesn't meet uh, the level of the uh, development and the level of awareness. There's still a huge gap between them. And right. would you care to elaborate why do you think it is? Um, well, it's it's really difficult to say. It's, uh, um, it's more to do with the in- industry that mm-hmm. um, our region is involved in. As you can see, what the haze is going on exactly. nowadays, and it's been yeah. going on for mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. You know, ever since I was a kid. For like, decades, actually. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. Like there's haze every year, um, and there, it there's definitely need to be a, a stop to it, be, um, or a, a, yeah, because it's 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 ridiculous. Because you point, you give a really good point. Like we're supposed to be a developing country, mm-hmm. and we reach a point where uh, we'd say we're red, we're kind of developed. Mm-hmm. Um, However, we still have these, um, this di- sort of lack of yeah. um, uh, something like uh, not exactly the awareness. I think good practices. Mm. I mean, for example, the right. recent haze. Um, governments could have uh, solved the matter easily by adopting a greener or more sustainable way of um, either planting palm oil or. Tr- clearing lands right. rather than you know burning forests exactly. and then now you have a situation where you know the whole region in Southeast Asia are facing haze and there needs to be a consideration on how to implement those practices because um, I'm not saying that we should uh, how do you say it, that the the total ban on palm mm-hmm. plantation for example like mm-hmm. that's that might, might not be the answer but, it's, but we have to consider the fact that Malaysia Indonesia we're uh, an area that has a lot of peat forests mm-hmm. and once these areas are exposed uh, you know, due to clearing of land they they basically they heat up and more forest fires will be ignited and mm. so we have to see that it has a domino effect as well yeah. so we need to be careful and find a balance alternative in in pursuing these type of industries 
Um, mm. However, like I mentioned before, we we either do that or we could just switch, you know, all all together. I mean, there's there's these new technologies on more sustainable means of agriculture mm-hmm. and also energy. And that's definitely something that we should consider adopting. And if I'm not mistaken, all those companies, they just go for the easier way to produce right. more and mass produce their products. So that's why the burning uh, is one of the ways and it's cheaper. But you know, companies faster. companies will go to the extent where mm-hmm. the, law, the law allows them to be or the law. Right. Uh, if the law is not being imposed to them or right. there's no law at all uh, to regulate these activities, Companies will go as far as they can. I think s- sure. um, just recently Singapore is going to help uh, Indonesia in, in managing mm-hmm. these forest fires. And um, but yeah, I think the the companies involved need to be more responsible. That's you know, true. And that's something that yeah they they should definitely. Yeah, exactly. Have. But and in the brighter news, I think recently ASEAN had like disagreement on um, um, illegal wildlife trade that they are going to. Um, reg- um, I wouldn't say reg- no, not regulate, but to to put a stop to it, which is really but good because I think that's one of the major issues happening right now because our population for uh, you know the Malayan tiger and our pangolin, for example, uh, mm. very endangered and it's due to this practice of legal wildlife trade. Mm. And so I think um, I mean this was discussed even since last year. Um, yep. um But this this year I think they 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 put it on the table again as for discussion and. Um, I, I think there needs to be more dialogue on it as well, um, and because uh, Malaysia is rich in biodiversity and it's really uh, disheartening to to kind of uh, realize that um, our own people are involved in these things. You know, mm. they um, yeah. um, and it's it's a not a really good pra- practice, and it, yeah, and it, sh- it should be stopped. And I'm really glad that they are. They're having this dialogue. I can I can already feel the sad vibe from uh, Jess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't cry, Jess. <laughs> I don't know. No, no. <laughs> don't yeah, kill the animals, thinking. guys. Yeah, Elena, you want to add something? I, I, <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a like thought. Um, and we're saying you know the companies are doing this and they're kind of like stretch as far as yeah. they can go, but you know they kind of do it because of consumers as well Mm -hmm. and I was just thinking like you know honestly I do not know where every single ingredient in a product that I buy comes from right so I don't know I I probably should know but I don't know if this like the supply chain down to like you know does this product come from something that's causing the (laughs) all the haze Mm -hmm. um is that what I'm buying I'm buying it but I'm supporting it you know yeah I'm I'm (laughs) sure the answer is is like almost in every single product yeah and you know like here we are all complaining about the haze but actually we're the ones kind of supporting it the demand is like still from the consumer so (laughs) that's I think we think talked about this earlier is it it boils down to education. I think if yeah. people are educated about what what they are buying, mm-hmm. you know, what they are using, I think they'll be more careful next time. Mm-hmm. But do you, but just do you know if we have access to that information? As in, can, can we somewhere online or in reports, as in in you know company reports or something? Is well, it possible to find that supply chain? Well, did you guys? Not really exactly, but uh, yeah. recently we discovered that WWF Singapore, they have mm-hmm. a website, they call it uh, We Breathe What We Buy, mm. and you mm. can actually find uh, information about products that uh, may contain palm oil. Yep. Right. Yeah. So mm. it is, it's a good way to educate ourselves and to be a more... C- conscious, conscious buyer. consumer. So, I don't right. want to be. I don't want to sound so pro Singapore, but that's the difference. Like Singapore, the information is just there that people can get it. Right. In Malaysia, as much as we, 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 some communities are very active, but then getting the receiving the information just right in your in front of your face, it's still not there yet. Yeah, I think it's also yeah. partly due to the fact that palm oil is a really big industry mm-hmm. here. So for sure. Yeah, of course. People don't want to jeopardize that, <laughs> but I mean that, that's the beauty of the online. Like, you can get this information like, like very the, easily, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Well, um, so we've been talking to um, Jesse Prime and Elena Adrian Asian, oh, t- t- talking all sorts of kinds of environmental issues. But then for the next segment, which will be our last segment, Adrian Heat, we'll talk more about their personal stuff, which is music, <laughs> and also how they have been involved in the club. So stay tuned. The Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. You're still with Grace and Arlene at Durian Heat, where we discuss issues around Southeast Asia. And we've been speaking uh, to Jess Ibrahim, who's a singer-songwriter, as well as Alena Murang, who's an artist in Malaysia. Hello. Hi again. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, let's talk about your music. We are very curious here. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, we did um, invited you guys individually before, but never we have two of you guys at the same time in a house and to talk about your music uh, of course um, you guys will be performing at Kelly FF uh, on yep. Sunday 18th of October right mm-hmm. so let's start with Jess okay yes <laughs> so you have a song which is related to environmental issues as well and then um, could you uh, elaborate more on that your music and your tunes um, well I started writing songs on environmental issues mm-hmm. um, ever since I started an NGO back in 2006 uh, with How uh, old was old that? schoolmate of mine. I was, I was thinking about like 13. Oh, uh, my, goodness. oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, with, along with some of the parents of my previous primary school. I see. Um, so we do performances uh, on environmental issues. But we try to use arts as, as a way of, of spreading those messages. And yeah, I just started writing songs on the deforestation on climate change and um, so you sorry you write songs on environmental issues first before like writing about love or or breakup (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty deep (laughs) well it was like uh, your love towards the environment (laughs) is deeper than anything else right (laughs) i I don't know like i just it kind of makes sense to write songs about that i guess at the time um but yeah, um, I was but I was partly influenced by you know like Zainal Abidin and mm, also Bob Marley. He's amazing. Yeah, mm. and started to listen to Bob Marley as well, and a nice. lot of their songs like I don't know they they gravitated towards more on very social um, based Messages. topics. And yeah, I started uh, writing songs. The first song was Tears of Trees, mm-hmm. I think, and um, so uh, as as I uh, pursued music more, mm-hmm. uh, especially after uh, my secondary school. Um, days, I I started writing about more general things, uh, and some some songs about love, if <laughs> if you will, and stuff like that. But, uh, however, I I still do sometimes write about uh, these issues. And I uh, about last year I started a band um, with some of my college mates, um, and we did we have like elements of. Uh, trying to mix it up like it's kind of like a fusion uh band where we have elements of alternative rock but also um elements of asli music mm. what and, is asli music uh asli music is a form of traditional music in Malaysia. it's uh it's like an ensemble type of, of style but um it's more like folk folk music uh, mm. And you also have a song about haze, right? Yeah. Oh, really? I <laughs> yeah. was just about to ask that question, actually. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're going to perform that at, at uh, Eco Film Fest. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So the our star, I think it's like about 8 p.m. And, and But there'll be like, it'll be really fun and exciting because we'll be playing with a lot of other, like, really cool acts as well. I mean, there's Faz. Yeah. Sure. There's Jumero. Elena is there as well. Elena, yeah. Razan Shah, Bill Musa. Venopian Solitude, I'm really looking forward to. Mm-hmm. Venopian Solitude, she's quite awesome. Mm-hmm. And, and mm. yeah, th- but, um, I, I yeah. Um, th- my question here is, um, do your ma- band members understand your, your lyrics as in terms of, like, do they relate to all those lyrics to themselves when they hear about all about environmental issues? Well, uh, I I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, they, uh, we do talk about it sometimes. Of they, course. They, they kind of ask, like, oh, what's, what's the song about? And I do I explain to them, and, mm-hmm. they, and they get more familiar about the topic. And mm. um, because we arrange the songs together, mm. so it, it really helps when when 
when we do uh, communicate about about the message and mm. yeah they, and eventually they they kind of like uh, kind of understand what what the song is about and yeah so you've been educating your your own band members <laughs> yeah I can see that yeah, we, we, we all teach each other a few things Aww, uh, yeah of like, course yeah but, uh, that's really sweet <laughs> <laughs> how about you Elena how oh, could you explain about your sape we really want to know about your instruments. Sure. So the sape is a lute instrument mm-hmm. uh, from Borneo. So a lute instrument is just generally an instrument, I think, just correct me if I'm wrong, it's generally an instrument that's made out of wood and mm-hmm. strings. And it sounds so, really beautiful. And then you've mm-hmm. also been giving uh, lessons to students. So do you see a lot of people uh, want to learn all the traditional instruments, especially sape? Yeah, it's really interesting because um, I started learning about 12 years ago, mm-hmm. and I was one of the first girls to learn. So, what do you me, mean first girls? You mean it's men for men before this? Yeah, yeah, it, <laughs> it was taboo for women to touch the sape before. Yeah, why? Um, just so there's several reasons. One was because the sape used to be a um, like a spiritual healing instrument mm-hmm. used du- during the the pre-Christian era. So mm-hmm. it was only like the shaman who were the men who could communicate with the spirits mm-hmm. via the sape. So for that reason, um, women weren't allowed to touch. It was more like sacred and stuff. Mm-hmm. But then after the um, the communities there, a lot of them became Christian. They mm-hmm. put aside all of those um, beliefs. Um, so we were taught by Uncle Matthew, Matthew Ngao. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's now recently been conferred as living heritage for the country. Oh my God! Wow. This is yeah, cool. and he's he's just so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and he, um, so I was quite young when I started learning, and me and my girl cousins were like, "Yeah, cool. We're the first girls to play the sape, and you know, we would play at like rainforest music festival or like different functions and stuff." But only I think two weeks ago, I was playing with him in KLIA two. We mm-hmm. we were doing like a fundraising gig. And there's an interviewer interviewing him. Mm -hmm. And he started saying things that I guess at the time I was too young to be aware of. Like um, he was kind of questioning himself if he should be teaching girls the sape. And he said he had to because there was there were no other young people interested in it at the time. Mm -hmm. And and he was really, really worried that the sape would die out. But Mm -hmm. now me and him are seeing like like really, really stark increase in interest to learn the sape, not only by, you know, people of the the, the community, um, of the Orang Ulu community, but by everyone. Everyone wants to learn the sape and, and now. You guys are doing vigorous education, I, I wouldn't say program, but mm-hmm. workshop, I suppose, to people outside who may not even know what sape is. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't use it vigorous to describe it yet (laughs) but I think we're doing what we can because there's not a lot of um, teachers I guess sape teachers because you can play some people can play the sape but they don't necessarily want to teach it and then some people have like different teaching styles so some some people only say like I only want like very serious one-on-one classes then I will teach you know Mm -hmm. Um, my approach is whoever wants to learn I will teach you what I know Mm -hmm. um so trying, like try, trying, trying to teach more. That's really beautiful. Well, uh, talking about sape, right? Um, how do people receive and see sape instrument today compared to those days? Let's say when you were just start mm. to learn the sape. How do people receive it mm, nowadays? When you they uh, when they see mm. your your performance of playing sape, yeah. uh, are they really familiar with the instrument, with the tunes they use singing and playing at the same time, or uh, do they do mm. uh, do people still have the perception you know girls should not play sape? Um, I don't think I, I, I personally don't feel like there's a perception that girls shouldn't play the sape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and if when Sarawakians hear the sape, I think mm-hmm. they feel very kind of nostalgic and, oh. and you know, they, they really associate with the sounds. But I don't think that a lot of people know the names of the different tunes or if they recognize this tune, right. um, that kind of thing. But it's very interesting. I was talking to Jess about it at the weekend, actually, how right. the sape is a pentatonic instrument, mm-hmm. so only five notes, yeah. but 
you know, people just love it. They love it so much. <laughs> and the pentatonic is very right. easily accepted um, uh, mm. worldwide, and the people can right. remember the tune very easily. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, Jess, how, how's your experience learning Sape from Alena so far? <laughs> it's been really, really great. Just say actually. whatever you want, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, no, she, she's, a, she's a really great teacher. And, was um, she strict to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, she, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but she's been great actually, and she's uh, been very educational in terms of the history of the Sapi, and mm. also mm. it's um I think that's it's the way of playing it, mm. and she always like paints this picture like to us on uh, the background of the. It's a very uh, riverside type of music, I see. and it's um it's really relaxing and and to learn. Because it's not just as simple as just playing those five notes. There's also like a lot of techniques involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, it's it's really hard sometimes. But she 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 gives us a really good lesson on on the skills and like the flicking and and the yeah styles. <laughs> which, um, but is it really easy because you are a guitar player, you're a guitarist, and the two to play sap sap is it easier? Right, I, I think, uh, yeah, me, definitely. I think if, if you're used to playing string instruments mm-hmm. before uh, learning the sap, you 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 can uh, kind of adapt it mm-hmm. but however it's it's not as simple as that All right. it's, it's a very mm. different uh, way of, of playing it as, as well like like I said there's a lot of different like specific kind of techniques mm-hmm. which I think just makes it sound more colorful mm. in itself and I think when I mean, if you do come by to watch Elena's performance yeah. you'll see for yourself the how beautiful it actually sounds. We're actually Tra- looking forward yeah. to watching yeah. the show. Yeah. Traditionally, uh, Sapi is being played in any sp- specific events? Um, so, before, and I, I actually don't know much about the pre-Christian times because mm-hmm. actually not a lot of people, like not a lot of the elders feel comfortable talking about it. I so, see. I only recently learned that it used to be played in... Yeah, in, in, you know, like spiritual rituals for like either healing or if they if someone could sense that a spirit was in a room, they would play like the song of the spirit in order to communicate with that spirit. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but apart from that, it was also played for just for entertainment purposes. Like, you know, we sit down and play the guitar and, mm-hmm. you know, the sape would just be played and it's usually accompanied by a dance. So... The sape player would play a dance, uh, play a song for entertainment, and then um, a girl would get up and dance. So it's called the hornbill dance, mm-hmm. um, and then accompanied by a, a male who does the warrior dance. And it was just for entertainment. Yeah. Nowadays, it's used. Sometimes it's used in church. Sometimes it's still used oh. for entertainment. Sometimes it's used to like uh, at the start of functions or ceremonies. It's it's a very very versatile instrument. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> really yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, before we end our shows today, uh, Elena and Jess, could you uh, tell our listeners when and then what time you guys are performing at KLEFF? <laughs> uh, KL, uh, oh. well, uh, my band, uh, Mon- <laughs> Monsoon Market, we're performing at 8 p.m. on mm-hmm. Sunday. And that's on at, the 18th of October? Yes, at the B Publica. Yeah. How about you, Elena? If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I'm playing between Monsoon Market and Faz. So I think it's 7 p.m. I think right. it's around 7.20 plus. <laughs> Thank you, 7.20. Right. <laughs> and yeah. then I'm also playing on um, Saturday in the square in Publica. I'm playing at 5.30 mm-hmm. to 6.30. And then at 1.30, I'm actually going to join... Um, you guys have to catch this, by the way. I'm going to join uh, Uncle Solomon, who is an amazing Sabe player from Miri. Mm. And we'll be playing to raise awareness for um, scholarships for Orang Ulu children. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, wow. So basically, this event, the festival KLEFF, is held from October 16 to 18. But do not miss out their amazing performances, which will be held on 18 of October. But like Elena mentioned, do visit a Square at uh, Publica mm-hmm. on the 17th as well. So thank you so much, uh, Jess and Elena, for joining us for the interview. Thanks, Thanks for, having, for having, having us. Thank you, guys. And all the best. And we'll catch you guys the performance today. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank bye. You. Thank bye. you. Bye.